Welcome to Vespers, our final session of evening prayer for this academic year. We open with these gentle words inviting us to still our hearts and calm our minds. And I invite you to join in the words written in bold. Darkness has fallen again over the face of the earth. Silence grows. Movement ceases. Night closes around us. God of all, darkness is no darkness to you. To you, both dark and light are one. Let us be still and know God. In our service tonight, we focus on the third part of the Latin motto in the University Cress, Via Veritas Vita, based on Jesus' words in John's Gospel, I am the way, truth and life. Tonight we're thinking about Vita, life this week in the season of Lent. And in this season, the time before Easter, we approach the first anniversary of another time period, a season of suffering and change, a season of trial. The pandemic has been with us now for a year. It has troubled our thoughts. It has altered our relationships and shaped our very lives. So as we come to this evening service to think about life, we are reflecting on another very familiar passage from John's Gospel. We might be ready, open to see it with fresh eyes, having been through this last year. What are the words of life in it for us? Let's join then in a prayer of renewal. O God, who makes all things new, renew us by your power. O guide who is always faithful, lead us by your vision. O hope who renews all life, bring us out of despair. O friend who loves us always, challenge us to live your love. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Take from us our hearts of stone and give to us hearts of flesh. Renew us by your spirit all the days of our life. Bring us to the place of rejoicing in your loving presence. Amen.
A reading from Psalm 107. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures for ever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices, and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Fulgat crucis mysterium, qua vita mortem patulit, et mortem vitam brotulit. David fideli camine, dicendo nazionibus, regna vita ligno Deus.
te fon salutis rinitas, collare tomni spiritus, quibus crucis victoriam, largiris ad te premium. This passage from the Gospel of John forms part of a conversation between Jesus and the learned teacher, Nicodemus. It contains some of the words most often quoted from the Gospel. For God so loved the world, gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. Yet it also contains a strange image of life a comparison of Jesus to a snake being lifted up by Moses in the desert. But to first century Jews, this was a well-known story of deliverance in the Hebrew scriptures, and it's recorded in the book of Numbers. Let's meander there for a moment to that dramatic moment of intervention, of healing, when circumstances had taken yet another turn for the worse for the people in Exodus through the desert, when their resilience was wearing very thin, Things had gone on for too long. The strain of waking up to another day of monotonous routines, of unremitting sameness, without the de- hoped-for destination being even close. Frustration spilled over in an all-too-human tantrum. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. We detest this miserable food. The promised reward of a covenantal identity, a land in which to belong with rich produce, seemed a distant dream. So nostalgia for an imagined and predictable, secure normality was kicking in. But even if that fond remembrance was for life only half-lived, a life of enslavement within the limits of a foreign power, under the shadow of a foreign god, But as that older story goes, the unleashing of serpents was an unleashing of the worst, of the people's misaligned desires and discontents. The invasion of harm-reeking poisonous snakes in the midst of the community was symbolic of death and self-imposed suffering, of the worst human choices, at odds with the goodness and order of created being, at odds with a life lived with grace and abundant trust at its centre. This image of the the snakes running rampant through the community is a horrific image. It's meant to be shocking and frightening, to evoke a sense of disorder, a kind of anti-life. But as such, perhaps it is relatable. We're meant to get how hard that must have been, how easy it is to slip into similarly desperate complaints when the going gets very, very tough. But things turn as they do in these ancient stories. When they saw they had gone too far and expressed their half-hearted begrudging prayers for help, for a reversal, for a graced intervention, the people begged to Moses for a change. And he made a snake on a bronze pole and lifted it up, using the very image of the thing which reached such harm and chaos. The poison-issuing snake became instead a focus for healing. And the rest is history, as they say, for the snake on a pole has long been a symbol for medicine. This strange image would also have been recognised by the first and second century Greek hearers of the New Testament times and the writing of the Gospel in John was in that language. For snakes also featured in Greek notions of healing 
and there was some awareness of the medical properties of venom. Now a snake sits at the heart of the World Health Organization's logo. And maybe it's not as strange as it might appear when we look at the use of vaccines, injecting something of the genetic makeup of a virus that would otherwise harm us can be the means of saving life. It activates our cells and it renders the virus impotent, it reworks the sting of death to bring healing. It's a bit like those snakes in the midst of that ancient community. The virus can no longer overwhelm. Instead of wreaking havoc, it becomes the means of order and life. So it's a symbol that perhaps has more resonance for us now than before. And it is this paradoxical transfer, the wondrous exchange that sits at the heart of these words in the gospel about life. For God so loved the world. This is about God's great healing movement towards the cosmos, the whole world, the earth and all its living beings, in Jesus' life, death and rising. And the power of that life, that love for the world, comes not through dismissing death or making light of suffering. No, that would be a sticking plaster attempt at making things better or a placebo approach to testing. It's not sufficient for our sickness unto death, as Kierkegaard called it. It's not enough to defy the contagion and the harm, to draw out the venom of sorrow and suffering. For that you have to share identity, the very being of the harm. That takes a radical, death-defying, carnal engagement with the whole messy project. God entering human existence, entering both the glory of being human, but also identifying with its downward pull, the descent into what exploits and what destroys what causes harm to ourselves and to others in the Earth's ecosystem. All of that. That's where, in Jesus, God belongs. That's where, in Jesus, God chooses to go. Even to despair and the spiralling towards death. That's what we're remembering this Lenten time, before Easter. And that is the paradoxical pull towards love and healing. For the love of God, for the world, for us, is stronger than death and darkness. Healing and repair can emerge, even from the havoc wreaked by this venomous virus. Because life from the very heart of existence, even its depths, is where God is, and that has the final word. So this ancient story reminds us of the larger narrative that forms a backdrop to our immediate emergency and our accumulating sorrows even now, and our growing hope that there will be new life after all, and not least thanks to the virus and that wonderful exchange. But it's also a reminder that physical death and life is defined and shaped within a larger narrative of meaning, of what it feels like to live well and what it is to experience loss, of how some went so much further than they could or perhaps should and kept healing, kept up the work of snatching life back from the jaws of death and destruction in these past months. What can be picked up for us after the chaos has subsided and we find our new normal of life? It is a love that is stronger than the downward pull of death. That symbol of the snake on a pole illustrates a great transfer of healing. 
except it now casts this healing in terms of the cross of Christ, that which takes the ultimate sting, defies the ultimate downward pull to death. And it means that that is not the only story. So to finish, I'd like to read George Herbert's lovely poem, The Call. He wrote this in the 17th century and picked up on that threefold motto. So this is a nice way to end this series. Come my way, my truth, my life, such a way as gives us breath, such a truth as ends all strife, such a life as killeth death. Come my light, my feast, my strength, such a light as shows a feast, such a feast as men's in length, such a strength as makes his guest. Come, my joy, my love, my heart, such a joy as none can move, such a love as none can part, such a heart as joys in love. Finally, we close with this evening prayer. O Trinity of love, you have been with us at the world's beginning. Be with us till the world's end. You have been with us at our life's shaping. Be with us at our life's end. You have been with us at the sun's rising. Be with us at this day's end. Amen. <laughs>